Hello, I'm Professor Afshar at Glendale Community College. This is Physics 101, Lecture 44. In this lecture, we'll discuss the connection between torque and angular acceleration. This topic is covered in chapters 10 and 11 of our textbook by Survey and Jouette. In our last lecture, we defined torque as the cause of angular acceleration. Torque is the thing that brings about angular acceleration. We also provided a formula for calculating torque, and we saw that torque is the cross product of position and force. However, we didn't make the connection between angular acceleration and torque very precise. In this lecture, we'll make that connection precise. Turns out torque and angular acceleration are related by the angular version of Newton's second law of motion. According to this formula, the net external torque acting on a system is equal to the moment of inertia of the system times the angular acceleration of the system. So if you want to know how a system will accelerate, you need to know the inertia of the system. You need to be able to calculate the torques acting on the system. You need to be able to add those to find the net torque and then the angular acceleration will be the net torque divided by the moment of inertia. Isaac Newton did not discover this formula as far as I know he had nothing to do with it. However, this formula is important and it is often called the angular version of Newton's second law because it resembles Newton's second law of motion. If you remember, Newton's second law of motion said that the sum of the forces is equal to mass times acceleration, and this formula has a very similar mathematical structure. Of course, mass has been replaced by the moment of inertia. That makes sense. After all, mass tells you how much an object resists linear acceleration. In other words, mass tells you how difficult it is to push an object. And inertia does the same thing, but for angular acceleration, an object with a larger angular an object with a larger moment of inertia will be more difficult to angularly accelerate. Of course, linear acceleration has also been replaced by angular acceleration and force has been replaced by torque. So we'll refer to this formula as the angular version of Newton's second law of motion. You can call it whatever you like. The important thing is that this formula is often used in the same way that Newton's second law of motion was used. We often used this formula to calculate the acceleration of an object, and then we use the kinematic equations to figure out its velocity and position. We'll use this formula in a similar manner. We'll often use this formula to figure out the angular acceleration of an object, and then use angular kinematics to figure out its angular velocity and angular position. Let's do a practice problem involving angular acceleration. A rod of length L and mass M is pivoted at its left end as shown. The rod is free to rotate about the pivot point subject only to gravity. It is initially at rest. Calculate the rod's angular acceleration when it is horizontal and free to rotate. So remember, the pivot point of an object is basically a point that is fixed in place. It does not move, but the rest of the object basically rotates around the pivot point. You can say every point of the object is executing circular motion with the center being at the pivot point. So we have an object that is free to rotate. Um, the force of gravity is obviously pulling this object down. The object is not going to go into free fall because one end of it is fixed in place. So the whole rod is going to end up rotating relative to the pivot point. We want to know what the angular acceleration is when we first let go of the rod. So when the rod is still initially horizontal, what happens when we let go? What is the angular acceleration at that point? So you should be thinking that the angular acceleration is caused by torque. So if I want to figure out angular acceleration, I first need to find the torque. And of course, torque is related to force and distance. Torque is the cross product of position and, and force. So we need to know those two vectors. 
In this particular case, the only force um, that's significant is weight. And of course, weight is pulling on every single atom of this rod. But on the average, we can say that weight is pulling on the center of mass of the rod. So if the rod is, um, has length L, then we can say that the force of gravity is being applied at the midpoint, a distance L over 2 away from the pivot point. And of course, gravity is pulling the rod straight down. In this case, the position vector is going to have a length of L over 2. Remember that the position vector in this context always starts at the pivot point and it points to where the force is acting. So here is our position vector. Here is our force vector. Remember that torque is RF sine theta. In our case, the length of this vector is L over 2. The magnitude or the length of this other vector, the force vector is mg. That's just weight. And then the angle between the blue and the purple arrow is 90 degrees. And sine of 90 degrees is simply 1. So the magnitude of the torque ends up being L over 2 times mg. It's important to also know the direction of torque. Remember, torque is a vector. For this, you will have to use your right hand rule. You can take your four fingers and point them in the direction of R. And then you can swing that vector down into the direction of W. As you do that, stick out your thumb and your thumb will tell you which way the vector points. In this particular case, the torque vector will point into the page. We call that the minus Z direction. We also represent a vector that points into the page using an X and an, a circle around it. So that's another way you can indicate the direction. If you're not yet very comfortable with the right hand rule, you might also notice that this force would cause the rod to rotate in the clockwise direction. So the rod would rotate in the same direction that the hands of a clock would move. So if you want, you can also say this torque is a clockwise torque. That's not a very precise description just because the labels clockwise and counterclockwise can be a little subjective depending on how you're looking at a clock. It is probably better to indicate the direction of torque as minus Z or plus Z. But for now, if you associate clockwise rotation with negative torque, that's probably adequate. Now, our goal was to figure out angular acceleration. Thanks to the angular version of Newton's second law, we know that angular acceleration is equal to torque divided by inertia. We are talking about a rod that is rotating around one end. At this point, you might want to go to your textbook and look up the inertia of such an object. You'll see it's one third ml squared. Torque, of course, is L over 2 times mg. I've put a minus sign in front of it because, as we discussed, this is a torque that points into the page in the negative direction. You can now simplify things and you will find that the angular acceleration of the rod in the z direction, more precisely the negative z direction, will be 3 halves g over L. Let's continue with the same practice problem. This time we want to calculate the rod's angular acceleration when it forms an angle phi with the horizontal line. So we have essentially the same rod, the same length L, same mass M, but we have allowed the rod to rotate. In a sense, it's falling, but it's not freely falling. Um, as it falls, it rotates around the pivot point and let's pretend that now is in, it's in this orientation. So we're focusing on a particular instant in time when the rod has fallen or rotated through an angle phi, and we want to know what the acceleration now is. Is the acceleration the same as we found before? We know that for an object in free fall, like an apple falling from the tree, the linear acceleration is constant. It has a magnitude of 9.8 meters per second squared. Do you think that the angular acceleration of this rod is constant? Well, to find the angular acceleration, we need to find torque because torque is the thing that causes angular acceleration. And to calculate torque, we need to know force and position. 
So once again, let's draw some vectors here. We still have weight. Gravity is still pulling the rod down, even when it is an angle phi. Gravity is acting at the center of mass of the rod, so right in the middle of the rod. And the position vector always points from the pivot to where the force is acting. So this blue arrow represents the position vector in this case. We can now calculate the torque. Remember, torque is RF sine theta. R is the magnitude of this position vector. It's L over 2 for us. The magnitude of the force vector, of course, is mg. And then we need to know the angle between the position vector and the force vector. Remember how you calculate that angle. You should not use phi in this particular case. You should first move vector r without changing its orientation. Put it in a configuration where both r and w have the same endpoints, the same tail. And then the angle that we're really interested in is this angle. So this is the angle that needs to get plugged into the formula for torque. If this angle here is phi, then theta is going to be equal to 90 degrees minus phi. Another way of saying that is that this angle here is theta. Theta and phi together form a 90 degree angle, so theta should be 90 minus phi. So the torque ends up being L over 2 mg sine of 90 minus phi. And this torque is also a negative torque. It points in the negative z direction or into the page. Or if you want, you can say that it's causing a clockwise rotation, which we associate with negative torque. We can now find the acceleration. Remember, the angular acceleration is the angular force, or the torque, divided by moment of inertia. It's a rod that is rotating around its end. You can look up its moment of inertia. As before, it's one-third ml squared. We've plugged in the magnitude of the torque, and I have put a minus sign in front of it, indicating that this is a negative torque. And now I find that the angular acceleration in the z direction is minus 3 halves g over l cosine of phi. This formula is interesting because it tells you that the angular acceleration of the rod is not constant. It's telling you that as phi changes, the angular acceleration also changes. So this is not at all like an object in free fall. The angular acceleration actually starts out uh, large and then as the object falls the angular acceleration becomes smaller and smaller in magnitude. And that's the end of this lecture. Thank you for your attention.